Yes. So welcome back again for live session. So I'm going to start the Mahavakya. If you want to access this Mahavakya, which is the mantra which is playing in the background, uh, Swamiji's initiation, please go check the Nityananda Media House in Kailash uh, YouTube channel. It's in the description of this live video and uh, you can find it under Mahavakya. M-A-H-A-V-A-K-Y-A. Yes. So um, if you have any questions, write it in the comments. I'll read and answer. Otherwise, sit with me a few moments. The space of unclutching, the space beyond mind, beyond thoughts, where you do not engage with your thoughts. You do not respond to your thoughts. You just stay in a space where if thoughts arise, they arise. You watch them arise, travel and disappear. You do not cherish them, do not entertain them and do not uh, try to destroy or get rid of them. Just like bubbles in a water tank. Watch them appear, travel towards the surface, and disappear while you remain untouched and unclutched. Like I said, if you have any questions, write it in the comments. I will read it and share the powerful cognitions that Swamiji shared with us to bring more clarity about, uh, about yeah, your question. Otherwise, you can sit a few moments Yes, I have a question about living the vows of Brahmacharya as a Westerner in the aspect of wealth. It's something I've often contemplated. I took Kavi in Adi Kailash but dropped when I came back because I was unsure how to pay the bills and, and all that. Yes, actually now um, Swamji has made the... He's, he's basically open the door for apatsanyas which is basically you live the lifestyle of a brahmachari of uh, an aspiring brahmachari where you are so you live the vows to the best of your capacity so you can at least maybe your external environment is not supporting you and you cannot for various reasons be in an environment where you can practice it fully but at least where you are start to cherish these vows, these seeds inside of your inner space. The vows of uh, Brahmacharya, which are basically Satya, telling the truth, Asteya, um, non-stealing, Ahimsa, non-violence, Aparigraha, living with minimal things, and Brahmacharya, so not basically engaging in relationships physical relationships with the other gender or the same gender, basically going beyond gender and allowing the life energy to rise towards your brain instead of being at the muladhara center for the sake of reproduction or I should say physical reproduction. So live it. See, Sometimes external environment is not making you or allowing you to live the vows fully authentically. But that does not mean you have to drop everything. Swamji was saying that we should not be having operating from fanatic conclusions. We should operate from powerful cognitions. So if you can live a certain vow, 60% of it, then at least live it 60% of it. Don't drop the whole thing because you cannot live it 100% of it. Whatever, be as authentic as you can. Stretch yourself as authentic as you can. As authentically as you can. And get the transformation and benefits that these vows manifest in the being who lives them. End of the day, Swamiji is always about living a life positive way with powerful cognitions. Obviously, you can only be life positive if you have powerful cognitions. So powerful cognitions comes first. So external situation should never put you in any form of powerlessness. You should never cherish any form of powerlessness. Always, when you are in a situation where 
Your mind makes you feel that you should be powerless, you should be depressed, you should be sad, you should be frustrated, you should be irritated. Do not listen to the mind. Do not invest your life, time and energy in your mind. Invest it in your consciousness, powerful cognitions. The situation is the way it is at that specific moment in time, perhaps. But decide to live powerfully, to manifest or to work towards manifesting what you want, but never cherish any form of powerlessness. Always be powerful, energetic, inspired. The aspect of wealth you're mentioning. Of course, a brahmachari, as much as possible, um, does not touch money. So, if you have to touch money because you are in a situation where you feel you don't have any other option, but you have to touch money and therefore compromise on the vow of, uh, of brahmacharya, at least the first, part, the first cognition which comes to me is at least touch it the least that you can. Only touch it to the bare minimum. Aparigraha. Live with minimal things. In the same way, engage with money in the minimalistic way. Whatever you need for your survival, engage to that level. Everything which is superfluous, unnecessary, extra or luxury, don't engage. Hold on to the vow of brahmacharyas, uh, the vows of brahmacharya. So I would say this is the first way of continuing to cherish these vows, even though the external situation might not be conducive for you to uh, live the vows in, in their full potential. Also, one thing I can share is the best way to live the vows when you are in a situation like this is enrich people. When you enrich people, people will be grateful. They will feel that having you in their life is a great asset and they will want to spend time with you and they will want to help you. So when you enrich people, people can, can do the, they can support you in the basic, for the basic needs at least a little bit, depending on the situation, but they can, they will start to support. So that also helps you to be, uh, to live the vows. That is why monks, they rely on society. They do not work and manifest wealth because they have to engage and spend more life, time and energy in the dimension of enriching others. When you enrich others, others are grateful towards you. And whatever basic survival needs you need in order to keep the body strong, healthy and usable, then people will help you and provide you that. So in that way, not only you fulfill the purpose of Brahmacharya, which is enriching the world and people to live a better life and more powerful life of higher states of consciousness, but at the same time you'll be integrated to your vows of Brahmacharya or you'll be more and more integrated to your vows of Brahmacharya depending on the situation of you, of course. When we operate from a dualistic logic, we do not see the possibilities. Because dualistic logic is always, like Swamiji said, it's a fanatic logic. It's this or that. There's no, there's no space of possibility. So what happens is that when something is not happening in the way that we want it to happen or in the way that we think it should happen, we just drop the whole thing and say, okay, whatever, I can't do it, so just drop the whole thing. No, don't drop. Live it to the maximum of your capacity. Live it to the maximum of the capacity that you see yourself, the possibilities that you have at that moment. Be authentic means live to your ultimate potential, to your maximum potential at that moment. Whatever you see possible for you at that moment, at least live that and continuously strive to improve that and to find ways of integrating yourself to the principles more and more. 
the vows of brahmacharya. If that helps, you can drop a like. If you have any other question, if, if anybody has a question, please write it in the comments. I'd be glad to share powerful cognitions, clicks from what Swamiji has shared with all of us. Otherwise, you can sit a few minutes, a few moments in the space of unclutching with me. Untouched by thoughts, not engaging, not destroying any thought. Whatever happens, happens. You just unclutch from the whole happening and experience the state of Paramashivoham. Oneness with Paramashiva, oneness with Swamiji. We have to, yes, very good. We have to find ways to hold the space. See, Swamiji is always teaching us about hold the space. And his life, he is the embodiment of somebody who holds the space for everybody. So because one vow seems to be compromised, does not mean you have to, uh, you can find a way to hold on. Like I said, right? If, if the vow of uh, you have to touch money because you are in a situation where there's no other way for your survival, you have to touch money, at least use in that context, try to be integrated to aparigraha, means living with minimal things. So in the context of wealth, only touch the amount of money you need to touch. You know? So like that, always finding a ways to align yourself and live these vows more and more. Live the powerful cognitions more and more. To keep the seeking alive, to keep the guru-disciple relationship alive. So that the initiations that Swamiji has given us can blossom to their full potential in us. Last few days, Swamiji has been giving amazing discourses about how important and crucial initiation is. Also, he also shared various uh, scriptural references, Shastra Pramanas, of, um, of how important and crucial initiation is. So once we are initiated, we are blessed. Life is made, actually, because life is a prank. We might not realize it now. But the life is a prank played by Maya on us. We realize when we leave the body. And when we realize that life is a prank, when you got initiated, you fall back in the, on the initiation. And that initiation gives you liberation. So at all costs, once we are initiated, we should live the principles and manifest the initiation in our life. We don't have to wait to leave the body for us to realize that Maya is a prank, that this world, this experience of this world is a prank played on us by Maya. We can live these principles authentically, ferociously, and break free from the delusion of Maya and live enlightenment, Jivan Mukta. Actually, another scripture was share, saying that the moment you're initiated, you are declared as a Jivan Mukta, which means living enlightenment somebody who lives who is established in the science of living enlightenment who lives enlightenment and that's also something that Swamiji has been enriching the world with he doesn't teach the science of how to get enlightened he teaches the science of living enlightenment because once you get initiated by Swamiji once you get initiated by Swamiji there's nothing else that is needed just start living enlightenment enrich the world So if you have any other question, please write it in the comments. I'll read it and share powerful cognitions to bring insights. Yes, so we have two questions. How to drop jealousy? So I'll start with this one. Yes, so Swamiji shared jealousy uh, is paired with comparison, 
Okay, so comparison and jealousy are both there and they are in the uh, Vishuddhi chakra, the chakra of the throat. So how to, to drop jealousy, you first have to stop comparing because jealousy happens as a side effect of comparison. You see something different, you judge it as better or worst. If it is better, perhaps you have some form of desire to have it and then you become jealous of that. So, how to drop jealousy? The first thing, one technique that uh, Swamji shared, is very simple. The Mahavakya, which, we are, which I'm playing now and you can see in the link in the description of this video, in the Nityanda Media House in Kailash YouTube channel, if you type Mahavakya, there's a different bunch of them. Chant the mantra and visualize the mantra rotating in your throat. That will heal the throat chakra. When the throat chakra is healed, jealousy is, disappears. See, jealousy cannot, if the chakra of the throat is blocked, only jealousy can manifest. If the chakra is open, the throat chakra is open, jealousy cannot manifest. So that's one way. There's different types of powerful cognitions also, which can help us to unlock the Vishuddhi Chakra, the Throat Chakra. Responsibilism is important. Jealousy, jealousy happens when, to a certain extent, we feel a little bit powerless towards manifesting what we want, right? If you feel jealous of somebody because they have uh, a healthy, fit body, for instance. Okay, let's use that as an example. If somebody has a healthy, fit body and you feel that, you know, you would want to work on your body to detox and bring more energy to it, more tone to it, more health to it, and when you see somebody with a healthy body, you feel jealous and like, oh, I wish I had a body like that, okay? So, if you stop there, you will be powerless and you will be stuck in jealousy and jealousy will, will, it will bring your energy down. But, if you decide, okay, I want to manifest a healthy body, whatever visualization you have about what you want or whatever, whatever you want to work on, then start to take responsibility for it. Maybe at the beginning you can only do a few things, that's okay. But start and just hold on to it, do it regularly and expand. It will, expansion will happen automatically because as you do it, you will become more confident, more powerful and you'll do it. So do, you can start with managing the food and the food patterns you have. Perhaps you enjoy certain types of food which are destroying your body. So dropping these patterns or starting to drop these patterns so that you can at least stop toxifying the body, doing some detox, taking haritaki, castor oil, neem juice, and so many other arigambul juice, Bermuda grass juice, so many things you can take, some herbs even, uh, Sanji was saying to detox the liver, you can take uh, ginger, ginger in the water or in your food, add ginger, so different ways of detoxing starting to detox and starting to be more physically active perhaps cooking or cleaning or doing some little bit of running and even if it's a little bit every day it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be like oh my god right away i have to go and do like two hours of gym every day no it doesn't have to be like that you can start but do it regularly make it turn it into a, 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 almost a ritual something that you do every day surely you, there you can find time. Because even if you do a little bit every day, after two months you will see major difference. So when the moment you start to feel responsible, what can I do about it? Instead of just being in the state of, oh, I don't have it, I wish I, have, I had it. If you just start to put more lifetime and energy into the responsible dimension of it, then you will start to become active towards that goal of yours. And the moment you become active, you will no longer be jealous because you will be goal-driven. Okay, I have to do this. I don't have time to sit and brood over and, be, and feel, you know, jealousy or whatever. I just have to go and work towards the goal which I want to manifest. So that unlocks the Vishuddhi Chakra also. 
and naturally any form of jealousy whether it is different sometimes it's subtle sometimes it's less subtle but whatever it is that blockage will be removed Yes, then we have another question. If, if that helps, uh, please drop a like, otherwise you can ask more question. Yes, great, amazing. Yeah, actually, responsibilism is, uh, is one of the powerful cognition which pretty much takes care of everything. Because most of the problems we have in our life is because we are not living the life we want to live, basically. We are not fully in tune or complete about the life we are living, and we feel for various reasons that, oh, I cannot live that life. But if you start to look on how you can start to work to manifest that, you will go into the space of action. You will drop the space of thinking, you will go into the space of action. And in the space of action, results start to manifest. And these incompletions, which, are, which, are, which happen from the state of non-action, of thinking, of mind, such as jealousy, they no longer, uh, we no longer cherish them. They no longer make sense. So we stop, you, we stop thinking or even cognizing these uh, life negative cognitions. There's other powerful cognitions as well that um, everybody is unique and what everybody needs to manifest varies. So because somebody is in a certain way, it doesn't mean you have to be in the exact same way. Not to say that you don't have to work on yourself and you should not expand, but this you don't need to be a copycat also. There's a uniqueness within everybody. You being authentic to your uniqueness and radiating that uniqueness to its full potential in, your, in the way you express, that also can liberate you from jealousy right away. Because it's a cognition, so it changes the way you think, the way you make decisions, the way you act, the way you speak. Everything changes when you have a cognitive shift. Another question is the five vows of sannyas. Yes, so I spoke a little bit about it with the first question. Five vows of sannyas, again, I'm going to share again. Um, satya, which means uh, speaking the truth. So avoiding to lie, um, avoiding to spontaneously lie. Because sometimes we, in a situation where we feel a little bit uncomfortable, we want to get out of the situation. So to get out of the situation, we will spontaneously lie. We will say something which will allow us to get out of the situation. But these spontaneous li lies um, actually weakens the heart. Swamji says lying weakens the heart. So whether it is a, a de deliberate lie or a spontaneous lie, uh, your heart becomes weak. And when the heart becomes weak, you have less strength to face life, less strength to digest life. And uh, that makes it more difficult for you to manifest what you want. So you start to go into lower states of consciousness. You start to cherish lower frequency emotions and all that. So satya is important. Always remaining integrated to the truth. Holding on to the truth. And Swamji says, if you don't know what to say, at least don't speak. But don't tell a lie. Don't lie. Tell the truth or stop speaking. But don't tell a lie. That will heal the heart energy. And it will give you tremendous courage to engage life, to, di to engage with life, to digest life, and uh, to be who you, uh, what you decided to be. When you, take, when you took the body, you had a reason why you decided to assume a human body. You will be able to fulfill that purpose when you have the courage to digest and face life. For that, satya is important to have a strong heart. Another vow is asteya, non-stealing. So that goes in pair with a parigraha, living with minimal things. So when you, when you do not, when you live with minimal things and, uh, and you do not feel deprived by life. See, one of the things which clicked with me very strongly was that living with minimal things and stealings are both um, associated to feeling deprived. In some form, we feel that we are lacking, that life has not given us. So that makes us perhaps want to steal something. Feel, hey, I don't have it, I want it. But you don't feel that you can manifest it in a powerful way. You feel like you have to steal it to get it. So it's powerlessness. And powerlessness will never bring fulfillment to you. 
So avoiding to steal is very important. So asteya, non-stealing, it's a little bit like spontaneous lying, right? You spontaneously you feel, oh, I want it, or I don't know how to get it, I'll never get it, or sometimes we use, we justify it in many reasons. Sometimes you feel, oh, society is crooked, uh, you have to be like this, you have to be like that to get it, so I don't like society, but I want it, so I steal it. So we have, we can come to various logics and conclusions to justify stealing, but stealing is stealing. And end of the day, you feel, if you feel deprived by life, you will feel deprived by life. So like that, avoiding to steal. So basically the vows of sannyas are all about coming back to a space of powerfulness. Instead of stealing, getting what you want, but continuing to believe that life is depriving you, because even if you steal and get what you want, maybe that will be fulfilled for some period of time. But the feeling that life is depriving you has not left you. You still feel that life is not giving you what you deserve or what you want. So that has to be addressed. It's not about fulfilling each thing. Your mind will come with so many things. Today it will be that, tomorrow it will be this, in three years it will be that, in ten years it will be this. It will never stop. So it's not, that's not the way to, to handle the situation. To, to, you have to have a cognitive shift. You have to realize that life is not not giving you what you, what you deserve, what you, what you want. You have to realize, again going back to responsibilism, you have to realize that you are the source of the life you're manifesting. If you are the source, you can change it. But for that, you need to decide, okay, let me do something about it. Let me have a cognitive shift first and then actions to start to manifest what I want. But cognitive shift is most important. In this situation, you need to stop. You need to identify why do you feel life is depriving you. And you need to realize that this is not true. So sometimes, you know, you had situations and um, in your childhood or somebody taught you or you heard it somewhere whatever but at that moment it impacted you and when it impacted you you just felt oh yes i'm deprived so no so you have to drop that you have to find where you got it and you just decide to say okay now i understood how i got it so now i no longer want to cherish it or you can simply you don't even need to know when how it happened you can simply just surrender and just drop it and say no i don't want it anymore I did this feeling of being deprived by life uh, that's not true you can be responsible and start to work and manifest what i want so these two non-stealing and uh, living with minimal things asteya and aparigraha they they make you manif they help you to do that living with minimal things is similar also you realize that there's a lot of stuff you have around you which is not useful but because you have anxiety about the future, fear about the future, fear that you will not be able to manifest what you need when you need it, you decide to accumulate stuff around you. But the problem is that deep down, you have a cognition where you feel that you cannot, you don't have the power to manifest what you need when you need it. And that's a big incompletion that we have to drop, have to complete. You are the source of the reality that you're manifesting. So you can manifest what you want. So these anxieties about the future and all that have to be dropped. So when you live with minimal things, Swamiji says, if you have not touched an object for the last six months, get rid of it. Don't keep it around you. It is not authentic. It is not enriching you. So it is just dead weight. And the problem is that when you live with so many things which you're not using, you create the space of Alakshmi, where Lakshmi does not come. Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth. I mean, she's expression, she's manifestation of Paramashiva, but she, we, we connect to her a lot through the dimension of wealth. What is wealth? And Lakshmi will not shower herself in your life if you constantly have anxiety about the future. Therefore, hold on to so many items in your life which you do not use and therefore just remain there stagnant and, and bring the energy of the space down because they're not contributing or enriching anybody. So when you live with minimal things, you, you address that pattern, you break that pattern and you realize what you actually really need because sometimes we feel we need things but we don't really need them. But we're under the impression that no, no, I really need it. But when you start to see how often do you use it and what do you use it for and how it is enriching your life, you realize, no, actually, I don't really need it. I could use something else instead. 
which I can which I'm using for something else so one item can do the job of two items or you can just discard it from your life because actually you just realize no that's not something which is important in my life so I don't want to waste uh, I don't want to waste my time with that item or whatever it is but don't leave things stagnant so living with minimal things um, tackles that pattern very nicely um, other vow is ahimsa so for those who just joined I mean I'm, I'm, I'm expanding on the vows of sannyas so ahimsa is the vow of nonviolence. so that's a very important vow because recently Swamji has been sharing a lot about the importance of operating from the space of nonviolence. But for first, we need to contemplate what is violence. One thing which I I realized is that in today's world, we are very impacted by what is seen. We don't necessarily easily grasp the space or the context from which things are happening because we need to really ask ourselves what is violence we think we know what is violence but deep down we don't have the right cognition of what is violence so that's the first thing which happens when you start to live non-violence you start to look into what is violence when you identify the more and more you understand and grasp what is violence you decide not to engage in these things and therefore become non-violent but violence can be very subtle for instance, Swamiji talks a lot about Krishna, how Krishna was the most non-violent being, even though he was there in the biggest war which happened in the history of planet Earth, and he, he basically told Arjuna to start a, to engage in that war, which resulted in so many deaths. So, but Krishna was not in the space of just killing, he was in the space of protecting the creation, the humanity, the universe. Because at that time, so many people had gathered weapons which were enough to destroy the universe. And he was there. He took the incarnation to protect the universe. So sometimes, nonviolence is not very evident. It's not very apparent. We don't really see what it is. But it remains there. So that's why we should not have reactionary assumptions. We should not come to our own conclusions too fast. And really contemplate and see what is violence. How is Krishna nonviolent? How is Shiva nonviolent? So there's few videos like this, which Swamji gave. He talks about how is he nonviolent? You know, when Shiva is destroying a, a demon, how is that nonviolence, right? So we can, you you need to grasp. We need we need to contemplate and grasp. So living the vow of ahimsa constantly makes you have a greater and more complete cognition and understanding of what is violence. And as you do that, as your expansion happens, as your cognition expands you uh, you stop cherishing violence sometimes violence can be just in being insensitive to somebody or a word can be violent but the same word could be non-violent it depends of the context and who gives it and what what it depends of so many things so like that we need to really contemplate so ahimsa is a very powerful vow and the last one the most misunderstood one perhaps is brahmacharya so basically it is, it is roughly and badly translated as celibacy, but it's much more than just celibacy. It's basically realizing that you are beyond gender, realizing your consciousness. And you are not bound by the male or female body that you decided to assume in this life. And you are not bound by the hormones that the body is having. And... Um, Yes, for the videos we'll share. Um, I'll share after this live. I'll have to find it and share it, but I'll look for it. And um, Brahmacharya makes you realize that Shiva and Shakti happens within yourself also. It is there. You don't. That doesn't mean that you cannot engage. That depends. That's a totally different thing. It depends of what you decide to do with your life and all that. But feeling that you need to, that is wrong. That is incomplete knowledge. You don't need to. If it is your decision, then that is your responsibility and you have to handle it. But you don't have to. A male body does not need a female body. A female body does not need a male body. The male body needs to complete with his male identity and realize he is Paramashiva. 
female body needs to complete with her identity and realize she is Paramashiva. They can do it through marriage, because back then marriage used to be for that purpose, to help each other to realize their Paramashivatva, Paramashivoham. Or you can be a Brahmachari, which means you do not engage with the other gender in any forms of physical ways or even engaging, trying to get some form of fulfillment through the other gender and um, or compensation, I should say. Because you should not seek any compensation from the other gender. And just looking within and transcending the gender identity to realize that you're Paramashiva. And what happens in the... And that is why also this lifestyle is also very good for manifesting powers because the Kundalini Shakti, when it sits in the Muladha Chakra and is constantly there and dormant, and the energy, life energy only manifests through the Muladhara Chakra for procreation, for reproduction of the physical body, then uh, if you stop cherishing this, this, this pattern of the body, that Kundalini energy goes towards the brain and feeds the brain instead. So the non-mechanical parts of the brain get awakened, the subtle grooves of the brain get ignited back, and you start to grasp more intense things about life, you start to understand life and the, especially the other we are multi-dimensional beings and we have many states of consciousness available to us so we can experience that we should the purpose of life the purpose of taking a human body is to experience your multi-dimensions and your multiple states of consciousness when you realize your multiple dimensions and the multiple states of consciousness you realize that you're not human you realize that you are consciousness, that you are Paramashiva, it becomes your experience. So sometimes not engaging with the other gender in a, a way which is not required, that will be very beneficial. That is why the vow of Brahmacharya is there for those who wish to live this lifestyle. So if it is for enriching, for instance, sharing powerful cognitions, there's no problem. But there is no need for for example, uh, for f other types of fulfillment between both genders. They should not, because otherwise there is a dependence. If it is a mutual, if it is a, a dependence which is agreed upon through a committed marriage, that's different. If you commit, but today, in today's world, it's very difficult because people go left and right. If they want, they, they get together. If they don't want, they break up. It's like very non-committed, very like... A, I'm just trying to get what I want. If I don't get what I want, well, screw you, kind of, uh, kind of thought currents. But uh, if it is a committed marriage, then you can, both of the individual will work together. They will be the reflection of each other. The, 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 the wife will be the reflection of the husband's inner space. It will be, she will use it, she will be a, become a reflection. Not the entire inner space, but a form of that. And simultaneously, uh, vice versa, the, the husband will be the reflection for the wife, for the wife to do completion with whatever patterns are cherished, whatever completion needs to happen. So that becomes a very healthy happening. Otherwise, Brahmacharya is you do it on your own with Guru. Brahmacharya is just you and Guru. There's nobody else. So it's just your relationship with Guru. Through that relationship, you do all the completion you need to do to realize your, um, your state of Paramashivoham. So the five vows of sannyas, they're not restrictive. If you look at them from a superficial level, you feel that, oh, you know, you have to, you cannot lie, you cannot steal, you have to live with minimal things, you cannot, you have to be nonviolent and you have to be celibate and not engage with the other gender um, in an inauthentic or inappropriate way for the purpose of this lifestyle, obviously, because we cannot compare the Grahista's lifestyle to the Sanyas lifestyle. It's a different lifestyle, it's a different decision. So context is different, the logic is different, so it's different. It cannot be compared. But, uh, but it can seem restrictive, but it is not actually. It is expansive. It makes you focus on the source of the problem instead of getting caught in the manifestations of this problem. Because sometimes, as Swamiji says, right, we fight with the tornado with a sword, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna achieve anything if there's a tornado and you jump in it with your sword trying to destroy it. So when we start to attend to manifestations, 
it's an endless journey. There's always going something new manifesting and then you're going to attend to this and attend to that. It's like endless. But if you attend to the space, which is the source of all manifestations, then the moment you have a cognitive shift, the moment you get initiated, I should put emphasis on that, especially now Swamji is talking a lot about it. If you get initiated, the space changes. When the space changes, your entire life changes because every your entire life is a reflection of your space. So that is why it is important to attend to the space. And that is the importance of Guru in one's life. Guru is there to help you to have focus on the space so you can identify the source of your sufferings and you can uh, remove them. You can attend to this problem to, uh, to the source. Just adjusting the lighting here. Yes. So, um, so yes, the vows of Brahmacharya are very... Um, lifestyle of Brahmacharya, for those who feel connected. As some people, they take the body because they want to experience this lifestyle. So these people should, should, should find it as fast as possible and experience it because only then they will be fulfilled. We, we assume the body for a specific purpose. We decide, depending on the biomemory we, we cherish, we decide what we want to fulfill in this life. So if you assume the body because you want to experience the lifestyle of Brahmacharya, then you should find this lifestyle, the right information, and the right guru to initiate you into this process so that you can be successful as fast as possible and reach the space of fulfillment. If you take the body because you want to experience uh, something else in life, because there's other things, if you want to experience success or name or fame or wealth or whatever, then you should, you know, um, have, again, I mean, guru is, is always there because guru is the source of cognitions. And whatever you want to manifest in your life, you need to have the right cognitions. And you need to be, to receive the, the grace of the Guru, the initiation. So, whatever it is, Guru is always there. But after that, you know, you focus, you have the right cognitions to manifest what you want. But for that, you need to have a healthy inner space, a clean inner space, a clear inner space. Which does not, there's no traffic jam of undigested thought currents which are not going in the same direction, not aligned and creating the, the, the feeling of conflict and suffocation within your own self. So that has to be removed if you want to be successful, uh, if you want to manifest what you want to manifest. It will happen. will happen and it's time right now Swamji is not available anyways to the world so we'll have to wait because the world is in majority not ready see Swamji is an extremely life positive being but uh, extreme life positivity uh, means that the life negative patterns will be removed but when you are used to operate with life negative patterns and you have to change and you're not willing to change then you will become violent so like that that's why Swamji has been facing this persecution because of that because there's many as a good chunk of humanity which is resisting the change the breakthrough so naturally when Swamji brings that level of life positivity then the people are shaken and they're not interested in in looking in and having the doing the completion, breaking the patterns, coming to a space of listening, space of oneness. So yes, but it will happen when time comes. Swamji will be available. Right now we have him every day, satsang. So really hoping that each one of you is watching, satsang. Swamiji said, if you have two minutes to enrich somebody, enrich them with the science of unclutching. So, 
the more and more we share this very simple meditation of unclutching, this very simple science of unclutching, the more and more we share it with people, people will start to implement it to whatever extent in their life. And Swamiji says that even if you implement it a little bit, it will give tremendous benefits. So like that, people will start to cherish less life negative uh, thought currents and then um, basically the attacks on the enlightened masters and avatars will be removed. Uh, before. Swamiji is an avatar, that's why he's, he's making himself widely available to public. But even enlightened masters or even back in the days when there was no avatars uh, during a certain period of time, enlightened beings always have to protect themselves because the society is not necessarily willing to digest the life positivity which an enlightened master or an avatar radiates. That's unfortunate, but that is the situation. I mean, the, the purpose of being on this plane, on Buloka, on planet Earth, is to realize mukti, moksha, liberation. That's why we're here. And an enlightened master and, or an avatar will lead you towards that. But sometimes, depending on the maturity of the being, of the soul, uh, the soul is not fully aligned to that. So naturally it resists, it resists the process. and in the process of resisting, naturally becomes violent. That is why people are abusing Swamiji for that purpose only. Because Swamiji is asking them to do things they are not willing to do. <laughs> right? If you ask people to stop eating solid food, that's not a joke. We are addicted to solid food. We are addicted to solid food. When we don't have solid food, we do not feel complete. We don't feel fulfilled. And we can live, the body can live without solid food. I mean, there can be a process, doesn't mean you need to drop everything. Swamiji says now, eat one solid meal a day and have liquids for the rest of the day. Can do. But when, uh, when Swamiji is, asking, is bringing these types of breakthroughs, of revelations, it's not everybody who's willing to do it. So that's why enriching, will persistence, holding the space for others, being available to others, enriching others is very important so that the cognition can change. When the cognition changes, you will feel, yes, I want to break my food pattern. And when, you, when that starts to happen, then you will have energy and you will have inspiration to challenge these patterns that your body is strongly established into. Actually, I was watching recently here, I was, there's some wild rabbits which come in, in where I am and they eat, and uh, even squirrels actually, squirrels and rabbits, are very much available around and when you look at them they eat all day that's all they do they look for food they consume food they look for food they consume food I mean the food pattern is so deeply ingrained in us from the the bio memory which we which we which we carry from the uh, animal bodies because before having a human body you have assumed animal bodies because human body is an evolution of animal bodies in the terms of a process towards realizing your consciousness. So when you see how animals are all about consuming food, you realize that the food pattern in your bio-memory is so strong. It's not a pattern which is easily breakable. That is why when you don't have enough the food you want or you don't have enough food, you get angry. You get unsettled, restless, frustrated, irritated, on edge, you know? So many incompletion, life negative emotions start to arise in you and take over your entire body. Hormones like adrenaline and everything related to anger and all that starts to manifest. And if you don't have the right cognitions, you will not be able to handle yourself. You will be angry and become violent. That is why Guru is important. When Guru initiates, he breaks the patterns. And at the same time, he gives cognitions so that you can reinvent the way you operate with your body. You can reinvent the way you live with yourself, the way you experience yourself, the way you experience others, the way you experience the world. So that is why people are abusing Swamiji. That is why people see as long as as long as the avatar or enlightened master plays in the socially correct space, everybody feels like, oh yeah, it's very nice. Socially, we have a certain 
understanding how much you how far you can go and all that but enlightened masters don't have these things and to get enlightened you have to break these conditionings at some point so when they go beyond this social conditioning then people start to become agitated they start to become restless so then it ends up and being abusing they abuse because because they can't stand it so they start to abuse it's very unfortunate but it is what it is so we need to like what Swanji says right you should not withdraw but you should protect basic protection not don't make yourself available to people who are abusive and violent like that they won't be able to harm your body Yes. So sometimes, see today, yesterday Swamiji initiated and said that uh, Sundays is days of initiation and Monday, Monday is considered the day of, the day of Shiva. So Shiva Bhaktas, devotees of Shiva normally fast during the, uh, on Mondays. And uh, back then Swamiji used to share like to do fasting from sunrise to sunset. So while the sun is high, you should not consume. When sun goes down, you can consume. But yesterday Swamiji was saying, you should do dry fasting. You should not even have water in your body. Today, actually, for me, I'm first time, I think, I don't remember, but first time I'm doing dry fasting. And the uh, sun has gone down now, so it's pretty late. It's late in the day. And I have not been bothered by anything. I did not have water, anything. Even puja prasadam, I did not consume, nothing. And it's possible. Body is very, I'm very much alive, energetic. I feel very good. So like that, once in a while, break the pattern. Every Monday, you know, shake yourself. Your body is stuck in a pattern of functioning. Food pattern, thinking pattern, drinking pattern. When you, when you change the pattern, especially the food pattern, you force the body to readjust. Sometimes in the process of readjusting, you feel powerless and become a little bit agitated and restless. But if you just hold on to Guru, Swamji's feet, and you just ask him, to make the process smooth, Swamji will take all the pain and you will have all the results. He will not take the pain, he will burn all the pain. Don't think he's going to take the pain, so i rather live the pain instead of giving it to him. Not like that. He doesn't have any pain. He's beyond everything. So, so like that, break. On Mondays, challenge yourself. Go outside of your comfort zone. Break the food pattern. If you, if you, if you every day you need coffee to live, on Monday, don't have coffee. See, like that, challenge yourself and just break the pattern. And when we break patterns, we start to become so much more powerful about the way we exist. And we realize that things that we thought were necessary are not actually necessary. So you regain that freedom, that power, and that gives you courage and confidence to go towards life with a new type of energy, new type of character, new type of individuality, of being, of personality, of, of ideas, everything. And then that helps you to manifest what you want and to change your life for the better. I should not be afraid. Maybe don't do it in a... If you are so much... If you're very, very much afraid, don't go too much. For instance, you can start by taking half the quantity. Then you take a quarter of the quantity. Then you don't take it. Like, you have to see. See, we should never be frozen in fear. Because when you're frozen in fear, you become inactive, you become stagnant. And when you're stagnant, then you're stagnant. Nothing happens. <laughs> the same patterns continue to run your life. So that's not, uh, that's, that's, that's not what we want. So you just, if you feel so much afraid and you, that fear is paralyzing you, then cut the quantity in half. Or take 
of the food you normally take. Then take 50%, then 20%. Like I said, it can be even to a, it can even start every Monday. If you cannot fast because you are very much afraid of fasting and what happens in you when you don't have food, then take half the quantity of food you normally have on Mondays. Then take 25%. But just keep moving in that direction. Never stop moving in that direction. Because you cannot live it fully, like again I was sharing a little bit earlier in this live session, because you cannot live it fully does not mean you should not live it completely. Be authentic to you. How much you see, how much you feel you can live it, push yourself to that, at least. Then see what happens. Explore. It's, a, it's almost, it's an adventure to a certain extent. It's, a, it's an adventure of rediscovering your possibilities, your consciousness. Your consciousness is more powerful than your anger. But we don't feel like that. When we become angry, we feel anger is taking over and you cannot do anything about it. So that should not be there. You have to realize that that is not true. That is incomplete cognition, incomplete conclusion about who you are. And if you start to challenge that pattern, you will start to realize that it is not true as an experience, not just as understanding, but as an experience. Then your life will change. Because that fear which is there at that moment is also there in many other situations of your life. So when you break that fear for that pattern, that fear is broken for so many other things in your life. So, so many other things in your life start to unfold and you will have a massive breakthrough in the way you live. We should, yes, that's amazing. Now my health is absolutely fine. I'm super active now. Great. See, and it's like life is, to us, I mean, that might not be the right word because it's, it has a, maybe a negative connotation, but it, life is addictive. The more you become active, the more you become alive, the more you want to be active, the more you want to be alive. It's like the more you want it, right? So it's, it's in the same way. So there's all, we, then we start to expand more and more. Actually, seeing the way we expand in life is a direct reflection of how uh, complete we are. That's why Swamji is, is putting so much emphasis on like, you know, see what, have goals and see how far you're manifesting. Have a, a direct feedback of your daily expansion. How are you expanding on a daily basis? And that is the reflection of how in tune with your consciousness you are, how, in, uh, how rooted in your consciousness you are into the cosmic principles. See, sometimes you might feel, oh, I want to have a, I want to do workout and all that, but I don't have 45 minutes, I don't have an hour, I don't have two hours, I don't know how I can do it. Doesn't matter. Start. Do five minutes. Five minutes, uh, maybe 10 times a day. Every hour in the afternoon, take five minutes and do some push ups or do some jumping jacks or do a little bit of jogging. It doesn't have to be like a fixed time where you have. No. You, you just find ways, have powerful cognitions, find ways to make it happen, to start the process, to engage in the journey. It can be three minutes, three minutes work out every hour. At the end of the hour, you have an alarm and you do a series of push-ups or sit-ups or a little bit of jogging or jumping jacks. And like that, you do that every hour. After two months, I can guarantee your life will be totally changed, totally changed. Three minutes every hour, or maybe even 10 times a day, three minutes, 10 times a day, is going to give a breakthrough. No doubt. You're going to see results. So don't... It, it, Swamji is, it says, everything I teach should be cognized in a life-positive way. So we should always see how to implement. We should not use whatever he shares to justify the fact that we cannot do it. Oh, I'm inauthentic, so I don't have this. No, that's not, that's not the way to cognize it. Okay, maybe you cannot do two hours of gym. Maybe it's not necessary also. Maybe it's your own idea that you need two hours, but maybe you don't need two hours. So, but just start. Three minutes every two hours. 
See, if you see like bodybuilders, for instance, they will be having strong body. They train two hours, three hours every day. But if you look at people back then also, they were doing farming. They were not lifting heavy weights and all that stuff. Sometimes they were because of the job, but they were using their shovels and they were using their body throughout the day and their body were very strong. So it doesn't have to be like, uh, it, it, there's, many, there's many ideas like in which we are stuck where you feel like, oh no, if I have to be fit or energetic, I need to be uh, doing the, you know, I don't know, 15 hours of gym a week and all that stuff. No, you don't need to, you can just do a little bit every day. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing a little bit every day. And my physical form is extraordinary right now. Little bit, many times a day, I should say. Not little bit every day. Little bit, many times a day. Yes. So for today, we'll close the session. Thanking everybody who came or are still here for the session. So these sessions happen every day and uh, planning to do more and more every day to reach out to be available to help to share to enrich to enrich for unclutching so yes check out the links in the description above if you're interested to know more about small clips of Swamiji on the website Itiana Media House in Kailash so, and uh, of course, each of these clips have the link of the original discourse also, the hour-long discourse most of the time. And, um, yes. So with this, we'll close with the Purna Mantra and hoping to see you in the next session. If you have any question as you live your daily life, come to these live sessions and uh, share your questions in the comments. It can be questions, doubts, or some thoughts which are uh, annoying you or putting you in a lower state, you share and uh, I can share some powerful cognitions of the teachings of Swamiji and uh, otherwise you can just come and sit in the space of unclutching. As unclutching happens, we do it throughout the session in between questions. So with this, I'm inviting you to come for next session. We'll close this one with the Purna Mantra. Madaf por namidam por naat por namudachete por nasya por namadhaya por nameva vashishyate om shanti 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 hari om tat sat sarvam bhagavat shri nityananda paramashivam padukar panamastu Om Nityanandam